not just because like we, Facebook is old and maybe people don't look at it in the same way that they used to, but those people are there. You want to go there where they're at, not necessarily drive them to your blog or try to get them through SEO, go where they, where they are, where they exist. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the SaaS SEO Show. I'm your host, George Fasilis, and today I'm very happy to be joined by Chris Anderson. Chris is the VP uh, and head of content at Greenslave. He was formerly managing editor at Gong, a company which I think most of you know. And before that, he held the role of managing and senior editor for Asia at LinkedIn News, where she was based out of Singapore uh, for just over two years. Uh, Chris has helped with pivots, build teams, create new regional brands, been a brand ambassador, structured social media marketing and content strategies, SEO strategies and operational processes, and much, much more. Chris, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Happy to be here. So I said a couple of bits, you know, about your background, uh, but I would like to hear from you. I mean, it's, I think it's one of the most impressive resumes I've ever seen. But uh, I, I would like to hear a few things about your journey. Okay, yeah, always, always happy to share. Um, yeah, my background is is, is definitely interesting. It go, it runs the gamut. Um, I, the main thread that runs through, I think, is content. Uh, so I've been doing content since probably 2006, I think it is. Um, started with print, with a travel uh, lifestyle magazine um, for a couple years in China. Uh, moved uh, from print into digital, uh, working with CNN, building up a lifestyle brand at, at CNN based out of Hong Kong. And then more heavily into media with Huffington Post, continuing with the travel thread, um, running their travel vertical. Uh, and then when they merged with AOL, also jumping in there and then heading over to Business Insider, uh, working for Business Insider, headed up a few verticals uh, based out of New York. And then with Apester, which was uh, and still is actually a, how do I put it, like a polling platform. So like those poll widgets that you see online, uh, we would work on on getting those. And I did marketing uh, for them in the US. Then jumped over to Hong Kong again, um, it, where I did work for Hong Kong Esports, uh, building up a regional gaming publisher network and also promoting the brand of the Esports League of Legends team uh, that we had in Hong Kong. And I worked for a social media startup um, based out of Hong Kong as well, where we developed videos for Hong Kong millennials on YouTube and Facebook. And then with HSBC, uh, which was based out of Hong Kong as well, um, where I was leading up the content for the uh, content operations team for Asia um, for about eight months, I think I was there. And then I headed into LinkedIn, uh, which you mentioned, and did my work there. So it's yeah, I mean, for for me, like my career has taken me all over the place, and it, but it has that common thread of of content and creation and, and storytelling, um, and and building up within a company and that aspect of it. So for me, like it's it's jumped around a lot, but I, I've always found that like audiences are super compelling. Um, I, I love audiences. I love engaging with audiences. I love trying to figure them out. You know, whether it's for banking or for uh, sales professionals, or now with GreenSlate where it's geared towards um, production accountants and, and uh, production finance executives in the entertainment space. They're all a puzzle. Um, so I, I could try to keep that mentality throughout my career and it served me well, I suppose. How is it like living in the uh, in Singapore and in Asia uh, more broadly? I mean, I, I loved it. Um, that's why I ended up going back after my first stints. Uh, I, it really appealed to me. Um, Probably would have still been there if you know events didn't change the course of you know why we were there. Um, you know, in in Hong Kong, um, <laughs> we were there until the, uh, China cracked down as, essentially, and uh, basically forced a move uh, on, on for me and my family. And we went to Singapore, and Singapore. Three months after we got to Singapore, the pandemic kicked off. Mm. Uh, so we got a good three months of time of like normal thing until the pandemic hit. And then, you know, I mean, the pandemic hit and changed, changed everything. Um, so I, I feel like Singapore was fantastic. The people were great, but we didn't get a chance to really like get to know it, you know, because of lockdowns and, and everything that was going on. But Asia, you know, I, I love Asia. I love travel. Um, this is what got me started in my career. 
Um, so I, I, I'm very internationally minded. Um, looking forward to getting more into Europe, you know, in, in the future. I have family out there. I want to come and visit. I heard a great, uh, let's say, quote from uh, Scott Galloway the other day. He said that uh, the U.S. is the best place to make money and Europe is the best place to spend it. Uh, as, a, as a person who has lived in Europe, uh, I guess my whole life now, um, it's, it's a very nice place to, to, to visit for sure. Uh, so now you are at Greenslate. For people who haven't heard of Greenslate before, can you like uh, say a couple of things about the company, its products, and uh, who gets the most value out of uh, Greenslate? Yeah, definitely. So Greenslate is it, it's new for me as well. Um, it, it's a very niche company. Uh, the best way to kind of describe it is it's an ADP and QuickBooks just for movie producers. Um, basically, we exist because the unions um, in the entertainment business require productions to work with an entertainment payroll provider specifically, and we protect those unionized crews from being in a position where they can't get paid. Um, it's a protective measure, if you will. So there's a, a, a not too much. I mean, there's four, four or five major competitors like in our space, and we're basically an all-in-one payroll system, but we have an SAS component. SAS component uh, to it as well too. So like we will license out the accounting side of the platform and those modules, uh, mostly on the international side. And our digital pur purchase orders um, are also available as a software as a service, primarily B2B. Um, and we do appeal to you know production accountants. So you know the, the numbers people behind uh, the scenes, uh, dealing with the budget and getting people paid for any specific production, like those are our, our bread and butter. So we work with the you know the Netflixes of the world and and um, Amazons and and the different uh, movie studios and, and companies when they have a production you know they might use Greenslate uh, and we'll work with them on that specific production and then we'll do that again uh, with another company too. How's the switch from uh, more traditional let's say industries like banking to even though you had experience with with startups um, as you mentioned earlier, but how is the switch from banking and what differences do you see between something more traditional, let's say, um, compared to what uh, you're doing now at, at Greenslate? I mean, with banking specifically, it's the size of the audience, right? So so banking, you're, it, from a content perspective, you're not so much B2B, at least in, in my run, my function, you're B2C. You're trying to get people in to uh, sign up for an account, you know, you're trying to pull them in. Um, from the a wide spectrum of uh, demographics, with something like a green slate, it's much more specific. You know, I, we are going after production accountants, uh, professional um, finance executives, right, in the entertainment industry. You know, so it's it's very narrow comparatively, uh, and the audience isn't nearly as wide. It's kind of in the middle of like, say, Gong and you know, uh, a bank, because Gong is going for sales, sales folks. There's a lot of salespeople out there at every possible company. You know, so you have a very wide net uh, to cast. You can reach out to somebody in manufacturing. You you know, you can do uh, technology. Like it, it broadens out a bit, but we're very narrow in in who we're trying to to reach and appeal to. And I, I think it must be very difficult, right? Because you can't. I don't know, but from I, I I'm thinking very often uh, through the lens of SEO. How can you reach folks that need a solution like yours, but at the same time, um, they belong to a very specific, let's say, industry. Uh, it sounds very niche to me, right? Yeah. Um, it is. Yeah. Uh, it, it is very niche. And this is why, I mean, I've only been at Green Slate since April, so I'm still relatively new. And I'm, I'm you know, building up you know, the different strategies and, and what we're focusing on with our, our CMO. And um, you know, SEO has not yet been a huge priority for that reason, because it is fairly saturated as far as like everybody knows who the companies are, you know? So if you, if you pull in the same, you know, uh, 2000 people that have seen you a hundred times, like, what are you actually bringing to them? You know, they're not necessarily searching for payroll services online, you know, they're, they're going to come to you directly. And this is reflective in our traffic. We see the majority of our traffic direct traffic because the, the names are, are, are known, right? But that's not to say that you know SEO is not a strategy, and it's not something that uh, you know we're going to focus on you know, as we grow out um, the content strategy. 
Gong did some impressive things um, when it comes to, and st still doing, um, when it comes to content. And you work there uh, as a managing editor. Any learnings from, from this experience or highlights uh, you can uh, you can share with us? Yeah, sure. So Gong was, it was interesting for me because it was my first true foray into SaaS. You know, it, it, it was, um, I, I'd been technology with LinkedIn and, and you know, banking and finance and, and media, um, but from a pure like uh, software as a service play, that was my first go. So for me, it was all a learning experience. You know, I, I came in as a managing editor, which was actually a, a, a kind of a, it was a lateral move for me as opposed to like a step up. And I actually took a bit of a pay cut because I knew that I was going to be getting a lot of learning on my side. And that actually enabled me to move into a VP role with another company at, at Greenslate because of all those things that I learned. And for for me and and that content, a lot of it was around process, you know, how to work and understand um, the the audiences um, around a technology product, you know, and in a B two B space more so than a B to uh, B two C space. So it was incredibly valuable to me. Um, one of the biggest things I, I think I came away with there was the interactions. Uh, with folks, you know, and really digging deep into those specific audiences, you know, pulling in the data, um, you know, around what makes salespeople tick, you know, and and really understanding that and getting into their minds, um, and, and then pairing that with the product itself, and like finding those um, finding those match points uh, between them, and really trying to push them and, and tell those stories around the product to get them. I don't know. There are so many tools uh, for salespeople, but I always, for some reason, I have this notion that salespeople are not easy to sell to because they can smell BS, you know, uh, from a mile away. Yeah. So I don't know if you had the same uh, experience at at one hundred percent, one hundred percent. And and that was actually one of the things I found fun about it was because you're, you're dealing with an audience that you can't send a cold email out that's so templated because they'll smell it, you know, they'll spot it a mile away and then you'll just end up in spam. Um, it, so it was very challenging from that aspect, but we had a we had a really good head of content there who, who knew his stuff, um, Devin Reed, uh, very, very solid. And he's gone on to do uh, good things since then as well too. I, I learned a lot from him um, in, in that that space. And that, that for me was a part of it too, is like we had to engage with sales people, you know, <laughs> and, and we had to ask them like, look, you know, if I'm going to, if you're going to get this in a, in an email, if you're going to get this in, in a, a piece of content, how are you going to respond? You know, just be honest with us. Does this work for you or, or is it BS? You know, cause they do have that BS detector on high alert at all times. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's what I think. By the way, uh, I read the reader, uh, which is, uh, Devin Reed's, um, newsletter. And indeed, uh, he has some very interesting, uh, you know, learnings from his journey and uh, very interesting insights uh, with the reader. Uh, something I would like to to ask uh, regarding your experience at Gong, I guess it it wasn't, it still is like a, a fast uh, pace environment. My question would be, how were you able to maintain consistency uh, when it comes to content across? marketing and like all other departments and initiatives you were working uh, on uh, back then? Yeah, I, this I, this answer goes for Gong and I'd say throughout my career, but process. Uh, you know, I've worked a lot of startups. Process is the first thing that you have to put into place. Like you can't just roar out the door and say, you know, we're going to get 50,000 followers on Facebook and, and have that be that. Like you have to put a process into place and, and establish it. Um, you know, you have to get your style guide done. You have to get uh, your your voice, your tone. You know, you have to get your data points that you're going to try to hit. You have to get a, your project management system set up and running. And you know, all these things have to be put in place. The bones and the framework have to exist before you just jump in full bore. Uh, and it was that way for me at, at Gong very much because uh, they didn't have a lot of that process. You know, there was a lot of things that were missing. The content was good. It was great, but they couldn't, they had a hard time scaling up, you know, because they didn't have that solid process. So a lot of what I did in the, my, my time there was to build that, put it in a place where it could continue to exist um, and, and drive that scaling that they were looking for at the time. And that that's 
same at Green Slate. You know, I'm working a lot right now in this first year on getting that that process down and establishing that framework. Um, if you don't do that, then you're going to make it much more difficult on yourself. What else are you working on? I mean, what's in your role as the head of content at uh, Green Slate? Honestly, it's a bit of everything because we're still small. You know, we're not a huge company. We have um, over around like 250 to 300 people. Um, you know, our marketing team is pretty small. We, we're a team of five currently uh, with plans to grow in, in the future. So I'm, I'm a head of content, but I am running posts for LinkedIn. I'm writing articles. Uh, I'm building up the Asana process, uh, you know, for, for content. Um, I'm, I'm doing a bit of everything. I'm writing emails. I'm establishing the templates. You know, it's I'm putting all of these pieces in place, and that requires me getting my hands dirty uh, with with everything. You know, so yes, VP head of content, but also copywriter, social media manager, uh, <laughs> SEO, you know, guy, like the full gamut. But that will be built out over time. You know, but I've I've got to put that all in place. Um, so it's a very startup mentality at at this stage of the game for me. And it sounds, I don't know, it sounds to me a very humbling experience as well, right? Because you, you come from, from a background a bit more traditional, let's say, where things may have been a bit more established, where you have people to, you know, work with you and handle all these different tasks. Well, now, like, you have to do some of these things by yourself. Um. No, I, I thrive in chaos, uh, to, to be totally honest. Like I, w- I went from HSBC where I had thirty a team of 33 people at a big corporation to senior editor, uh, individual contributor at LinkedIn. That was a shock. That that was the change, right? Where I went from that big team to like, oh crap, I got to do everything myself now. you know. And that shifted my mentality from I've worked on my career and built up to this level. I've been leading teams for a long time and now as a man of one. You know, but that that humbling experience, that that chance to kind of go back and get back into it, has looped me back around to now. You know, where I've, I've gained more experience because of that. You know, I got to work at LinkedIn because I took that step back, and now I'm at GreenSlate um, in a similar role where I can take that individual aspect and I can take the what I did with the team and apply that at the point when we're ready to do it. Um, so I, I honestly, I recommend people to do that if they have the chance and if it's something that makes sense for their career. Can you talk about uh, Green Slate's corner strategy? Uh, what are your main areas of focus? Right now, a lot of it is building up LinkedIn. Uh, so I'm, I'm working on getting the company page on LinkedIn uh, to a nice state, uh, having content that's reflective of what we do, reaching the audiences that we want to reach. There's, I think LinkedIn is a very underutilized platform in a lot of ways. Uh, I mean, think about it. It's got professionals there. <laughs> You know, like it's the it's the whole point is around like your business and your professional career. Like, why would you not focus on that? And I think a lot of companies really miss that point. So I'm I'm working on elevating the LinkedIn presence. I'm working a lot around the newsletter side of things, where you know, building up the general newsletter, building up smaller niche newsletters to appeal to the right audiences. Um, I'm working a lot on obviously the the tone and the style and and you know who we're working with and the experts that we want to bring in to represent Green Slate to provide value to, to audience. So I'm identifying a lot of those people a lot of those people right now, um, starting to pull them in, get contributions, um, and build up that base of uh, knowledge. So so that's yeah. And we just redesigned the website as well. So that took. <laughs> I mean, a website redesign is is difficult. We did it at Gong for the homepage before I left and then jumped right back into it at Greenslate over the course of the summer. So we have a nice new website uh, with some good copywriting um, that took a lot of work as well too. Regarding LinkedIn, you're trying to build up the presence there. Is it through the company page or through like diff- different uh, you know uh, personal profiles uh, from both? Yeah, so I, I work a lot uh, on the company page. You know, I'm trying to build that up, but we have people within the company who I'm also working with uh, to have them elevate themselves on LinkedIn in their topics, and then that that has a nice interplay between the company page and and the company and their profiles too. So if you know we have somebody who is an expert in tax incentives. Um, you know, they're going to start posting like what tax incentives are, are happening in the industry. And then I'm going to go and I'm going to share that on the company page. I'm going to create a poll. I'm going to cross over that content. And I'm also going to start applying that to like the newsletter. 
you know, I'm going to bring that in and say, hey, look, we've got this poll on LinkedIn, go vote. You know, we've got this person who you want to follow because they have awesome updates. You know, th this kind of thing can be replicated, you know, on TikTok or Instagram or, or wherever your focus is. Uh, but for us, because we're so niche, you know, LinkedIn is is a, a, a good place, especially when paired with the fact that, you know, I, I worked at LinkedIn and have, a pr have pretty good insight uh, into how it works. You also mentioned newsletters a couple of times. And I would like mm -hmm. to ask, you have a, a general, let's say, newsletter, uh, but you also mentioned some more niche ones, some more specific to uh, certain topics that your audience is interested in. My question is, it may sound a bit odd, but do you give names to each of these newsletters or is it just like, uh, I mean, is it something like a standalone media entity, let's say, or mm. uh, how do you approach that? It depends. So like there will, like we, I will name like our general newsletter uh, in, into like a name. You want to have it branded. Like you want it to be something that people open up in their inbox and say, oh, this is blah, blah, blah. I, I I can respond to this. I can I can identify with it like something unique. Yes, it's green slate. Yes, it's gong, but it it has its own brand within the brand. Uh, we did the same thing with gong, where we had uh, a very data focused newsletter that we put out monthly that was incredibly successful. That was bringing original content. It wasn't called the gong newsletter. You know, it, it was called its its own thing. I can't think of the name right now. It's terrible. Um, <laughs> it was memorable. I swear to God. But you know, it, it had its own name that people can identify with, um, and, and then that becomes its own thing, its own support for the company. You know, look at um, the hustle for HubSpot. You know, it is a great example. Like they bought that newsletter because it was so strong as its own brand, and now it's tied to HubSpot. That there's nothing but benefit uh, that that comes in that kind of brand association and relationship. I agree with you, and I see more and more. Uh, examples of companies that um, sort of, you mentioned uh, HubSpot and, and the hassle. Um, SM Rush is doing some interesting moves on that end uh, with the acquisition of Backlingo and now tra and more recently Traffic Think Tank. And I see examples, Ahrefs, for example, they have a a webinar series which they call uh, this never happened and the whole concept is that as per my understanding we there's no recording right you, you shouldn't expect to get a recording out of this webinar so you should attend right uh thus the name this never happened and i see this as a not a pattern um, because not many companies are doing it but i see this as definitely a part of the future uh where there will be like standalone media entities, as you mentioned, like brand within a brand. I think that's that's a great way to to put it. Um, and yeah, I think we will see more more of this in in the future. Well, think about it. If you're if you're building up your space with expertise that is informative and valuable to your audience on its own, all that does is build trust. You know, and and that association with your brand, when people start to look at you and they see, hey, they're not trying to sell me something necessarily. They're providing me with uh, a how-to, you know, on becoming better at my job or knowing my industry better or improving my career. And that's tied to Greenslate or Gong or you know whatever company it is. That's a that's a big powerful thing. You know, this is it, it's storytelling and respecting your audience. Um, and, and this is something that when I started getting into the marketing side that like I really wanted to focus on because with that a, a journalistic background, um, an editorial background, I would always look at marketing and be like, oh my God, like, do they think I'm stupid right now? You know, I can tell that you're selling me something, you know, or you're bragging about this YouTube video that's a commercial that you're putting on YouTube with some fake views for one that are bought and it's obvious that they're bought and you're talking about this thing like it's just the greatest thing that's ever existed no <laughs> you know no it's it, it's not because you're not like respecting your audience you know you're you're appealing to other marketers in the space you know you're not appealing to the actual wants of the of the people who are searching for that content or who you want to find your product or your brand so it for me it's important and and this is actually what i like about the fact that I've worked at Gong and now Greenslate is I'm I'm able to like take that mentality into the marketing space. What are your thoughts on on SEO? I mean, you broadly uh, you, you briefly touched on that, uh, and 
sort of mentioned that this is not part of your focus uh, on at, at the moment. At the moment, <laughs> at the moment. But what are your your thoughts on that? I mean, do you have experience? I guess you you will have um, you should have experience like uh, with with SEO um, after all these years. But um, what are your thoughts specifically about Green Slate um, and? Yeah, how do you think about um, using it, leveraging it uh, in the future as a, like, uh, yeah. Totally. I think at a, at a base level, there should be SEO incorporated into everything. Um, there, there are certain levels of SEO that you can do. Obviously, your your audience is going to know it, almost everything that I could possibly say here. But from from my perspective, if I'm looking at a piece of content and it was written without the intention of being like, this is a SEO focused article, right? Because there is a difference, you know, you go and you search, uh, you get the keywords that you want to uh, really focus on. And then you go and build out that content around those keywords to pull people in, as opposed to, I didn't do that at the beginning. And now I want to go back and make sure that there's some elements of a- SEO relevancy, right? Like there's two two sides to this. So at the very base, I want to make sure that there is SEO relevancy in the content that we're creating, and then that that it gets supported by those SEO specific um, articles, blog posts, you know, what have you, that are built around that, but with an editorial focus in mind, right? So it, it and I think this it, it is challenging to to do. Um, I mean, again, I come from an editorial background where working in news. If you look at news headlines, like there's very obvious differences in the SEO for uh, the SEO headline and like the headline on the front page, and then the headline that that comes in on the um, on the article itself, right? Like there's multiple headlines, there's multiple ways of doing it. You have specialists that are just going and saying, "No, you need to plug this word in here and there, here and there." Um, so I understand that like there's always that challenge with with content, um, but I'm I'm very pro, <laughs> you know, making sure that it's relevant because the traffic that you get and the people that you can bring, even if we are niche, is still important. You know, it's still going to make a difference in the business in the, in the long run. Like you want to be up there with your competitors. You don't want to see your competitor above you when they're searching for it. You know, even if it's 5,000 people instead of 50, right? Um, so I'm cognizant of that. Uh, it, it is in the works for, you know, what I plan on, do, plan on doing. Um, but not there yet because it is still early days for me. Um, but that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, what are your thoughts on, I would like to sit here a bit and discuss, uh, AI and there are, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, you can so that one. <clears throat> there are many things going on uh, on the AI front, uh, in the last few months. Um, and even though I feel my personal feeling is that the dust has sort of settled, uh, I don't see the same buzz around AI. Uh, there is obviously still um, some some buzz around it, but I would like to hear your thoughts and also whether you have found any like practical, very practical, uh, good use cases for AI um, in your process and the systems you you built at at GreenSlate. Sure. So. Yeah, AI, man, boy, it's changed everything, right? Like it's, I haven't seen an impact like this in in the content space um, since the internet. You know, I mean, it's it's that big of that big of a deal in in my mind. Um, I'm, I'll I'll break it down first from like a SEO point of view. I think it's going to put a lot of SEO writers out of work who cannot adapt to using the tool uh, for their jobs, right? Like if if you are an SEO expert and you understand how to craft articles and do these things, AI can do that. Um, and it's going to get better and better and better and better. Like the the, the growth is ex- exponential as far as how this thing learns. You know, if you go into um, ChatGPT and open AI, just, you know, every release, it's better than it was before. You know, if I go in there and say, hey, where should I plug in um, this keyword to make it relevant. And it gives you the answers. This is something where traditionally you would go to an agency. You would have somebody sitting next to you on your team who could explain that to you, right? And it's getting to the point where you can ask these basic questions of it and get decent answers. Um, not perfect yet. You still see a lot of garbage out there. And I think that that's part of the problem too, is that people are just using this tool now and it's spitting out some real trash. Uh, as far as like the quality of the content that, that comes out. So there's that balancing that needs to happen. 
But S- SEO professionals, specifically who are writers, they're going to have to use this stuff, um, or, or they're going to have to find a, a, a new way of doing things. Um, in the same way that I think you know, copywriters in a lot of ways, because like grammar and all these things is just you know, if we can write it in, as me, you know, if I if I feed. AI, uh, all of my uh, newsletter articles on LinkedIn, like, hey, write write this as me, it's going to come out pretty decent. You know, I'm going to go back through and edit it. So I, I got to be on top of these things. Um, and that's how I use it, right? Like I am constantly trying to keep up to date with what's happening and the changes and how I can use it and implement it. Um, whether it's, do I want to uh, craft a outline for a landing page? You know, I, I take a brief, I plug it in, and, and I give it the specifics of where I want the different copy to be, and use that as a base to jump off from. Right, not creating final content per se, but like helping me frame things, um, helping me generate ideas around different concepts that I want to put out. Right, like it saves time. It's not doing anything that I couldn't do myself, but it's just doing it quicker. You know, it's still me. I'm still providing it that information. It's just helping me do it faster. Um, so yeah, a- AI is, it's crazy. Like I, I use the images, uh, you know, mid journey for my blog, excuse me, my newsletter on LinkedIn, um, to create the feature image cause they're engaging. And I, I don't like stock photography if I have the choice of not using it. You know, why would I use a stock photo of, you know, people up at the table, you know, in a, in a, conference room looking boring when I can go and do something colorful and compelling uh, that will catch somebody's eye, right? Like, why wouldn't you do that? You know, the tools exist uh, now to be able to really, you know, work in this way. And so I, you got to keep up. You got to keep up. Yes, you definitely have to keep up. Uh, but do you feel that this is a moment like, uh, you know, the transition from print to digital for uh, journalists? And do you see a lot of folks, um, Basically, I don't know, uh, having to change work and uh, do something else because of that. Not at Green Slate. I mean, we're we're still very people focused. You know, like we respect the fact that you know people do work. Um, you know, if if you look at the entertainment industry as a whole, there was this thing called the strike that just hits. You know, the writer strike and the actor strike, and one of the big concerns there was around AI and its use and and implementation. Um, within the entertainment industry? Is it going to take over script writing? Is it going to like use instances of actors to replace them in the future You know, with, the, with their consent or without their consent? Um, so that concern has been, I think, reflected, especially through the strike, you know, and, and the fact that it's there, it's real, and people are like, hey, you know, <laughs> we have to maintain the value of, of the human connection uh, and the human creative process and, and copyright <laughs> and, and you know what what is actually yours and and owned i think these are are still questions that are going to be shaky for quite some time um but yeah you do see people changing if you look in media there's been a few publishers that have openly said like we're doing ai now um you know there we don't have writers for some of these posts if you look at linkedin they have uh articles that are generated by ai where they go and they ask in your feed if you want to contribute to it um, and so, but those are created by AI instead of a writer or an editor, you know? So yes, it is definitely impacting people in their work and in their jobs right now, for sure. Being more into the changes, uh, in Google search and, you know, with the introduction of SG, uh, search generative experience, um, how do you think this will affect the amount of traffic that Google sends to websites, brands, publishers, uh, whatever. I mean, it depends on how Google, how good Google gets. And I'm assuming it's going to be pretty damn good at identifying the differences in, in AI written content and human written content and the combination thereof. Right. And then what Google values as valuable content, you know, if it starts seeing that like AI written content is bad. Uh, and should not be promoted to the front page, and Google's going to address that. Like the, you know, and then we're going to have to roll with whatever that is. Um, the AI will have to adapt in order to meet those requirements as well, too. Because if these companies that are producing this AI and, and cre- you know creating this content in conjunction with humans loses out on you know Google search, why would somebody create content 
with AI because the whole point is to get volume and, and get traffic and get people to visit your site. And if like it totally negates the whole purpose, right? So it depends on Google. It depends on on how hard they restrict it or not, or how they structure it. You know, do they start putting a lot of indications like this is AI content as opposed to human content? How visible do they make it? How much do they, they do they knock it? What are the criteria around what they consider good AI uh, content? Um, like all these are things that are I mean, we have to see what Google and even Microsoft to a lesser extent with Bing does. One thing I, I noticed, and I don't know if you have uh, like similar experiences at the companies you, you worked um, with, is the fact that I don't know if anyone like actually reads a blog post end to end nowadays, right? People just skim through the page, they may read the like, uh, you know, sections and like headlines and maybe the, the the bullet points and so on and i feel that we are heading towards a, a a time where the blog may not be as important as as it used to be right oh. um and if that that's the case then i feel that there will be other content types like like window uh, right uh, or content on on linkedin and so on that may be a bit more uh more prominent do you see that happening and i mean first of all already happened yeah yeah no already happened i mean look at look at the the media consumption um patterns of of people you know they're on social media social media has been around for what 15 years or whatever it is now they consume video they consume gifs yeah it, like it's blogs like the idea of a blog is kind of dead if you look at it as a blog you know but if if you look at it as its own kind of how do, how do I put this if you look at a, at a blog post as its own unique beast right like who am I trying to get with this just this one piece of content you know like who, who am I reaching whether it's SEO or not what can I do with this one piece of content can I chop it down into individual parts that I can put on different channels to reach more people, you know, can I incorporate a uh, a slideshow? Can I turn uh, this list into a spoken video on LinkedIn or for Instagram? If you if you start to look at it as like that jumping off point for different kinds of content, or even looking at different kinds of content that you can filter into a blog, right? So, for example, if I have somebody I'm working with on my team who's creating a post on LinkedIn, maybe I'm taking that post from his profile, and this is. I've, I've been doing this before, even um, uh, Green Slate. What if I take that and I flesh it out, you know, and I, I turn that post into a blog and I turn that post into a video, you know, I turn that post into all these different things. So I, I look at it as one part of a whole, you know, either that spark of inspiration uh, for other parts or there's a spark of inspiration that turns it into that blog, which I can then go and apply SEO to bring in more people and more eyeballs. But if I look at a blog as like, hey, this is my brand blog page, you know, go to my brand blog page. Like, no, <laughs> I'm not trying to bring people to the blog on the website. Like that, that, I'm not trying to do that. There's not a lot of value in that anymore. I would rather people subscribe to a newsletter. You know, I'd rather engage with them there, where I can be have a more personal interaction, understand what they want, um, than just try to send them to you know the blog page on on the website. I, I think that's. One of the things that all these changes with AI and now SGE that's that's happening right now is that it brought quality into focus. And the, the thing is that with SEO, you can be average and still be rewarded. And I think that a lot of why there is, you know, this fear mongering right now and this echo chamber of like uh, as it is that is, and everything is going to like change and so on is because I think many content marketers can't like see a future where we can't be average anymore. I mean, we have to like put out the the best content we have, right? Because mm -hmm. if you publish if you publish something average on 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 LinkedIn, right, you will get instant feedback. Right. Well, whereas with with SEO content, as long as you see the traffic coming in, I mean, you will not say that okay, this piece of content was not a great piece of content. 
I don't know what your thoughts are on that. I, that that's a that's a, such a wonderful point. I mean, the the, the quality, it's always got to be quality um, because if you if you pull in ten thousand people to a, a how to article and it's it's not good, you could end up doing more harm than good to your brand, uh, and and you know people are just going to bounce away. You know, so it, and this is something that is that does bug me sometimes about SEO is that often it's looked at as like the lowest common denominator of, of traffic. Like we just need to get traffic to the website to look good for growth, right? Like you want to hit that growth number. Okay. Six months from now, if we do this keyword on, you know, X amount of articles, we're going to hit that. But honestly, who cares if those people don't stick around? Who cares if those people don't convert, you know, from that, from landing on that page, or if they're just, they don't like it and it doesn't represent your brand well. You know, so I, I think that 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 still happens. <laughs> you know, you still read things where you land on your search like, "Oh, I've been looking for this, but it's not what I expected," and then like you just forget about it. You know, so that quality aspect, the, the truly not just thinking about it from an SEO perspective, but from what is this going to bring to the people who are going to read it, truly value wise, and understanding your goal with it, not just from a traffic perspective, really helps. You know, um, are there other aspects to that SEO strategy that are going to um, be applicable to social? You know, I mean, it's like a, a law. You can't talk about social and SEO in the same sentence. You know, like you'll get butchered for for that in a lot of cases. But doesn't mean that you can't have a great idea that was implemented for SEO that you could then take and ideate, you know, and, and turn into something else or, or, or vice versa. But, at, you know, at the end of it all, like it has to be good. Even more so now with AI, uh, because there is so much junk out there that people can land on. If you want to differenti- differentiate, it has to be good. Full stop. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, second to last question, I would like your thoughts on the future of content marketing uh, for SaaS companies. Uh, you did it with um, uh, with with Gong now at at GreenSlate. Where do you think this whole thing is is going? Uh, how does the future look like for um, content marketing? Any of you want to touch on SEO as well? Uh, feel free. <laughs> uh, that's a big question, um, boy. The future of content marketing in SaaS. I think with anything, SaaS companies, it, they're gonna have to. They're gonna have to find the audiences where they are and where they exist, right? And and that's a challenge with SEO because it is narrow to a degree. You know, you're reliant upon the search engines to to bring in traffic. Um, but differentiation by channel. You know, if, if I come into a traditional company that's maybe been around for a while, they're probably ignoring some channels. You know, they're ignoring a YouTube, they're ignoring a... Um, Facebook, there, there, there's some there's some space that they're not focused on, and I think teams that are going to be very successful are going to have specialists who understand each individual channel. You know, like there's somebody who really gets TikTok, you know, and under, understands the language of the people who are there, the target audience that you're trying to reach. You're going to have somebody for LinkedIn. You're going to have somebody f- in these specific areas. I mean, that's obviously reflected with a bigger company because they have the resources to do it, right? Like. That that's the main difference is how much resource do you have to actually invest in this differentiation across the board. But I think a smart marketer uh, for a, a SaaS company is going to focus on one or two areas, it, it, and that's it. They're not going to try to do everything. They're going to try try to do a few things really really well, whether that's STO or LinkedIn or you know a newsletter, you know wh- whatever it may be. Like you're gonna you're gonna nail those things, and then you're gonna move on. Um, and I think the more folks that that realize that, the more you're going to have success. Um, as for the future of it, God, things change so quickly. You know, um, just looking at AI and how how quickly things are changing right now, I think it's really hard to predict where it's going to go. And, and because of that, I think adaptability and flexibility. You know, if you're agile and you see AIs coming in and you work within your teams to Say, hey, we need to know this tool. We need to understand it. We need to work with it. Um, you're gonna be you're gonna be in a better place. So I think agility, flexibility, adaptability are gonna be very very key for a successful marketing team um, going into the next five years, especially. Especially, you can't be stuck in your ways at this stage, right? Yeah, at all. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you. By the way, you mentioned TikTok a couple of times. Do you see like a use case for B2B uh, companies uh, when it comes to TikTok? I mean, it de- again, it depends on who you want to get. <laughs> you know, uh, for B2B, it's, I think it's much more challenging than um, B2C, obviously. But if you identify those people that they exist on that platform, then why not? You know, I, I have I have considerations to where I would not go for TikTok right now uh, for a variety of reasons, you know, both company wise and you know my general thoughts. But you know, if say production accountants exist on Facebook in a lot of different Facebook groups, we need to have people in those groups. You know, not just because like we, Facebook is old and maybe people don't look at it in the same way that they used to, but those people are there. You want to go there where they're at, not necessarily drive them to your blog or try to get them through SEO. Go where they where they are, where they exist. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, so that was a great conversation. Uh, last question I, I I ask to all uh, guests: uh, Where can people find out more or uh, about you or reach out if if they'd like to? Yeah, definitely on LinkedIn. Um, you can follow me there. Go to my profile page. I also have a newsletter called Career Forward, which I have. Habitually not updated recently um, because when you start a new job, you know, you kind of get involved in the job and, you know, your side hustle goes by the wayside. But I, you know, if I had more people like come in and follow me, uh, you know, I might be inclined to update it a bit more. Uh, it's, it's called Career Forward. You can find that on my profile as well, too. Um, and just, you know, I'm, I'm always happy to engage with people on, on LinkedIn. So if you find my stuff, you drop a comment, uh, want to chat, always happy uh, to do that. Always find time to do it. That's great. This was uh, this was great, uh, Chris. Thank you very much for doing this. I know it's also late for you uh, where you're at right now, so and- I, I appreciate uh, being so generous with your time. And no thank you very much. Sure.